Nijmegen, hopping off point for the Rhine offensive, a mad whirl of traffic heralds the approach of zero hour. Transport of the 1st Canadian Army is marshaled into starting positions for the drive. For many weeks, a static period has been enjoyed in the north. This has enabled General Montgomery to regroup and lay the foundation for the last round offensive. Finally, supplies and reinforcements are in position. On a day well ahead of schedule, the great attack begins. lines of waiting tanks and carriers to move off. Anti-tank guns roll up under the barrage of our artillery. Slowly moving ahead on main roads, the infantry crosses the starting line. The flooded country makes amphibious vehicles a vital part of the advance. Jokingly dubbed the Inland Navy, the waterborne infantry is just that. They are even issued with life belts for their hazardous marine advance. Striking out across the German border, they actually sail from objective to objective. the northern tip of the Siegfried line progresses favorably. Advances of one and two miles are made each day. The enemy, meanwhile, reacts sharply with many bitter counterattacks. The 1st Canadian Army advances on a five-mile front deep into the Reichswald forest. Heavy smoke screens hide their movement. To delay their advance, Jerry has blown great gaps in the dike. The floating army forges ahead just the same. The Rhine is reached and lined in great depth. General Montgomery comes forward to view progress. To General Quirar, he expresses satisfaction. Monty warns the enemy, my armies are poised for the knockout. German towns are overrun. Bake, Kaken, Verheyen, Kellen, and Cleve. The main Siegfried line is pierced. Seven days, 8,000 prisoners are taken. Soon, Allied washing will hang from all battered bastions of the Siegfried Line. At Grand Mer, Quebec, members of the Royal Canadian Army cadets take part in winter maneuvers. Representative of more than a thousand similar detachments training across Canada, the company passes in review. Having completed advanced training in the Laurentians, they demonstrate the fine points of winter campaigning. Canadian Army officers supervise. Organized in 1861, 
the Royal Canadian Army cadets have expanded since the war. They now total 110,000 members. Composed of boys from 14 to 18 years of age, they are found in primary and high schools across Canada. His Majesty the King is their Colonel-in-Chief. Their motto is, Aker Aker Pori. Translated, this means, as the maple, so the sapling. Thus the lads follow in the footsteps of father and big brother in Holland and northern Italy. Nijmegen, a big event in Canadian Army history, is occupying the attention of all troops. The Blue Diamond Hamburger Stand is celebrating opening day. Tasty, wimpy specials are well worth queuing up for. Hungry Canadians are right on the job. Built by the RCE, stocked by the Canadian Catering Corps, Blue Diamond eatables are on the house. It's a long time since hot, juicy hamburgers have gone down the hatch. When they are free, they are twice as sweet. Tilburg, social note. In the Protestant church, an old Canadian wedding takes place. Major Yalmerson, MBE, is the lucky man. Nursing sister Muriel Fumerton is the lucky lieutenant. Smiles and sunshine, not to mention glasses of moonshine, are in order. Rice and confetti convey the best wishes of pals for a long and happy marriage. A honeymoon in Paris gets the life of wedded bliss away on the right romantic foot. Italy. Under enemy shell fire in forward area, a typical army church service is held. The congregation arrives from frontline duty. There's no putting on your Sunday best. Just a few quiet minutes in a ruined chapel and then back to the job of war. Army padres of all denominations are soldiers plus. Human and kindly, their lives from day to day are an inspiration to all troops. Australia. Canadians arrive in the land of the kangaroo to aid in the war against Japan. Specialists of the RCEME form a vanguard to the main body who will soon be knocking around the Nipponese. Australia's General Clanch, with Canada's High Commissioner, takes the salute. When the spotlight swings from west to east, Canadians will be in their pitching. From the mud and flood of Holland, Canadians on leave visit the Canada Club in Paris. A good, soft bed with plenty of springs is the first attraction. It provides quite a contrast to waterlogged outdoor boudoirs. Being able to wash in hot water out of a tap is a pleasant experience almost forgotten. The next stop is the information desk. Here the right answers are given in a courteous manner. Tickets may be booked for Paris theaters from the Opera to the Folie Bergère. Three guesses which gets the biggest play. A gift shop carries a line of attractive souvenir merchandise. Controlled prices allow soldiers to buy articles at a specially reduced price. One part of Canada Corner Club arranges for hospitality. No possible service is overlooked to make the leave a happy one. All this and pretty attendance, too. A walking tour is the best way to really get to know your Paris. Twelve attractive young university students are on tap to guide leave men to all the sites. An electrical itinerary map shows in advance just what route you will be taking. History plus glamour sharpens the interest. When the tour is over, a hospitality lounge bar provides Canadian-style food. After the long jaunt, ice cream, coffee, and French pastries just hit the spot. 
soft music from the string orchestra makes Johnny Canuck feel like a millionaire club man. Every leave must come to an end. After saying so long to hospitality friends, it's time to hit the trail. At veterans reunions after the war, it'll be, remember the time we were on leave in Paris? <laughs>